You're live with Mark Dykes and In the Game High School Sports Magazine on News Talk 105.9 WVGA. Back with Jeff Davis, and we've got Ed McMinn with us today, and he has written uh, several books, actually, uh, about colleges, and uh, Ed is a, a retired pastor, and he's he's tied the scripture into these books, and it's just a great concept. Ed, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, Mark. Um you're really slumming. You t- I heard you say you had Vince Dooley on here last week, so you really we're really taking the tumble down this week. Well, no, no, we no. I, I think we're staying along the same line. I think it's a great book, a great concept. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and then how you uh, started to getting into this this book writing deal here. Well, before I went to the ministry, I was a journalist. My wife, Selena, and I have have quite serious ties to Valdosta. Uh, both of us graduated from Valdosta or have degrees. I taught at the college for several years in the mid eighties. Um, she graduated from Lowndes here. And so, uh, before I, before I went to the ministry, I was a journalist for most of my life. I went to the ministry late in my life. And so uh, several, a couple of years ago, while I was still in active in the ministry, I enjoy reading daily devotions. But I, quite frankly, even as a pastor, I found that most of them were pretty boring. And I, I'd say it was divine inspiration, that the idea of I, we need something here that catches people attention, people's attention, and then will lead them into a discussion of their, that will tie into a discussion of their faith. And so it occurred to me to put the, the perhaps the thing that most people in the South, or at least the Southeast, are passionate about is college sports. And so the format is pretty, if you read our daily bread, the upper room, the format is, is pretty much the same. You start out with a daily Bible reading, although in this case, instead of a general story, you have a Georgia Bulldog story or a Tech story or an Auburn story. Um, yeah, now for those books. listening, it's not one not one book with all those. No. It's one book with Georgia stories. Right. You, you, nothing you've got but daily Bulldog devotions stories. for diehard fans. You've got a Georgia, Georgia Tech. Now, there are actually 10 titles now. We have Auburn and Alabama to go with Georgia, Georgia Tech, Florida, Florida State, uh, Tennessee, South Carolina, Clemson, and NASCAR, which is always a lot of fun, but it's different. And then you have what I do is after I tell the story, then I tie the story into a point of faith that ties back to Scripture. That's why it's for diehard fans because you've got to be a Bulldog fan, and it, it is a serious discussion of faith. Well, I tell you, it's certainly a great concept, and and uh, I was reading over the, uh, the the Georgia book, and uh, the the drive to the nineteen eighty national championship really began with a stolen pig. You know, I never knew that. I'm a diehard Georgia fan, and I, that's an interesting little story in the way you tie that in. Well, I I brought a few notes because, as I mentioned a moment ago, I've actually written now more than a thousand of these individual devotionals, so I don't remember all the stories anymore. But I think that one occurred during the spring. After spring practice back then, they generally had a party. And at that time, the seniors on Georgia's team uh, were pretty broke. They didn't have any money. So one of them, I, I, I wish I could remember who it was that came. If I, I think can, it was Scott I, Warner, I think. Yeah, I thought it was Scott Warner, but I yeah. hesitated to say. Scott Warner came up with the idea that they could steal a pig from the veterinary department over there, from the swine research and the – the livestock from the ag school and barbecue a pig. <laughs> so they had uh, one of the big linemen there was an old barbecue guy. So three or four of them went and stole a pig there and um, killed it and barbecued it. And they, they probably would have gotten away with it, except that one of the freshmen decided he, he wanted to play a joke, one of the younger players. And he took the head of the pig and he rode by and there was this young couple sitting on a bench or something making out and so he took the, the head of that dead hog and threw it out there tore them and landed right at their feet and of course the girl the girl went berserk and the guy unfortunately had the presence of mind to get a tag number so the pig was up then and they actually uh, coach Dooley was pretty mad about it as was coach russell and so he he put the seniors uh, he made them stay at school all summer and paint fences out in the middle of the day in, you know, 100-degree Georgia heat all summer. And when they finished painting the fence, he'd go back and make them paint over again. 
In other words, he had them out there the whole time. And what happened was that all of the, the younger players, they had to work, they had to pay back for the value of the pig. And the younger players, all the players on the team who weren't involved, nevertheless came forward and volunteered to help pay for the pig. And they all, some of them came and helped paint the fences. And what uh, happened was that it created an unprecedented sense of team unity. And Eric Russell was on record as quoting at one time that he was more than glad that that happened because he thought it really affected the attitude going into the 1980 season. Right. That's an interesting story. Very interesting story. Uh, Now, was Georgia the first book that you wrote? No. Actually, the first two, uh, this is how the world works today. When I had the idea, I actually sat down and wrote the Auburn book first. Oh, my goodness. Now, Well, (laughs) the reason was simple. was Auburn was the closest school, so the research was easier to do, uh, to, to drive to Auburn. And so in these, this day and age of the Internet, after I wrote the book, I, I got on the Internet and got some, contacted some agents who, would do Christ, who were interested in handling Christian authors who would also unpublished authors. Um, and I emailed him with the concept I had. I emailed several of them. One of them wrote me back and said, I'm interested. I'm going to a booksellers convention. I'll pitch it. He pitched it. And Simon & Schuster, well, it was Howard Books then, liked the idea. So they they signed me up, and they wanted to do Tennessee and Alabama. So those were actually the first two that I did. Uh, I tried to convince them, and I saw it again this uh, in an article in the paper last week that Georgia now is the second best-selling collegiate merchandise school in the country after the University of Texas. Um, and I tried to convince them that Georgia was the best-selling school in the SEC, but they had Tennessee and, and Alabama in their mind. So. Well, now, have uh, have you always been a sports fan? Always. Uh, growing up, always. Never a moment that I wasn't. Um, and I have found, after I went to the ministry, of course, I still didn't, I still maintained an interest in sports. In fact, it was a rule, it was an understood policy in my church that if you, you or your family was going to have a personal crisis or a great problem that you could not have it, on Saturday afternoon in the fall. <laughs> you either had to have the crisis on Friday or Sunday, Sunday afternoon. But I've always been a, been a sports fan. and uh, we, I, I really believe that what the value of sports is in these books is that I just sports is just serves as the perfect avenue to find metaphors for life. I don't think there's a life situation we can't encounter that sport can't reveal something about it, and also about our faith. And that's what I've done, I think, that's different, was tie sports into faith. Well, it's certainly a great way to introduce people to the Word. Uh, you know, as you mentioned, somebody picked this book up, maybe not not know what it was about. Of course, when you start reading it, you know, you don't want to put it down. You yeah. know, these stories are interesting. And, of course, sports lovers, I, I can see them certainly wanting, wanting to get this book. Well, what I find that most men do, although it's women who usually buy the books, they buy them for their sons or their husbands, most men will sit down and read all the way through and then maybe go back and use it as a devotion where you have a reading every day. What uh, in, in, in doing these books, and you've done 10 of them, uh, what's a couple of the more interesting stories that you've uncovered? Um. I have a few favorites. One of them involved, you know, how many, I'm sure you remember the, was it 1982, I think, the Stanford Cal game that's always been called the strangest game in the history of college football. Where the fans were on the field the and band, the band, yeah. Yep, the band ran, uh, ran on the field and, and Cal won the game as the running back ran into the band on the last play and scored a touchdown and won. If you look at that clip, if you ever see that clip again, look back and see if that running back doesn't just really run right into a tuba player and just lay him out yeah. his way in the end zone. But I don't think that was the strangest game uh, in the history. I think Tech and Georgia played the strangest game in the history of college football. Back in 1904, they met in Atlanta's Piedmont Park. That was, of course, during the early days of football. And it was Piedmont Park was a baseball field. So all around the baseball field was a 16-foot high fence. And it was raining that day, so that you need to get that picture. It was a miserable, wet, rainy day. There was a 16-foot high fence all around the field. And 
and during the course of the game, Tech drove deep into Georgia territory, and Georgia held them. A great goal line stand. And as was the approach and the policy back then, Georgia, when you were in trouble, you punted. So Georgia immediately lined up on first down to punt. Well, now in those days, there technically wasn't an end zone. So the goalposts were on the goal line. So what the Georgia punter did, a guy named Arthur Sullivan, he backed up as far as he could right against that fence to punt the ball. And when they snapped the ball and he punted it, to, to his surprise, his kick hit the goalpost and then caromed backwards over his head and he stood there and watched his punt sail past him and sail over that 16-foot fence. Well, everybody kind of stood around and looked at each other for a minute or two, including the refs. They didn't know what to make of it. They got together and, and talked it over. And they decided that since there wasn't an end zone, that ball was still in play. Oh, my goodness. So what you had then, you ever, anybody ever play King of the Mountain? What you had then was – Kill the man with the ball. Yep, yep. <laughs> was 22 players, 11 from each side, trying to get up over that 16-foot fence. It was wet. It was slippery. It was muddy. And, of course, what they would do is they would build a pyramid to put a player on top of it, and then a player from the opposing team would come over, run into it, knock it down, everybody would fall down. Or when a player got close to the top of the fence, a tech player, for instance, a Georgia player, would grab him by the ankles and yank him down. Well, then finally – Arthur Sullivan, the punter, and a tech player named Red Wilson made it up to the top of the fence and then jumped and then disappeared over the fence. Everybody sitting there waiting to see what was going to happen. Well, now they were out in an open field, and the grass was several feet high, so they couldn't find the football. So they spent several minutes all on their hands and knees trying to find the football, and finally Red Wilson fell on it, saw it, and fell on it, and the ref, who was over there with him, signaled touchdown. Hmm. And – Nobody still knew what was going on, so he clambered back up that fence and stood up and held the ball up, and all the Tech fans went nuts, and Tech went on to win. I'm going to tell you now, that's a story right there, Jeff. What do you think about that I'll tell you, that's, uh, that's, that's, I've uh, always thought that was the strangest play. That's like backyard rules football yeah, right there. It was. They now, is that, feature, is that in one of your books? That's in the Georgia book. That's I in think the I, I, I told it from a Tech standpoint in the Tech yeah. book, too. I used to tell it twice yeah well i'd I'd put that one in in both the books that that's uh i tell you that's quite a story right there the um there's uh another i was going to say one of the interesting anybody remember pepper rogers oh yeah Mm -hmm. remember pepper was kind of a flamboyant coach at tech for several years in the 70s and pepper really embraced the 70s lifestyle if you i think you probably remember his hair most of all he rode a motorcycle he didn't wear socks and he permed his hair And everybody was okay with him except for that perm. They didn't mind him riding the motorcycle. Uh, But his Pepper's biggest game was in 1976 when Tech upset Notre Dame, beat Notre Dame 23-14. to And as Pepper's mother was leaving the Grant Field, uh, she overheard one of the Tech fans say, you know, that was a good win, but I still don't like Pepper's hair. Nobody got used to Pepper's hair. And – Mrs. Pepper's mama, being a good mama, retorted, well, maybe folks don't like your hair either. And then the woman turned around and looked at him and said, who are you? And she said, I'm Pepper's aunt. And when he heard that story, Pepper Rogers realized that his hair was so bad that even his mama wouldn't claim him oh as God. her son. So he went to the barbershop the next day and got his hair cut, and that's how the perm his mama helped him get rid of the perm when she wouldn't even claim him. Well, I tell you, son. I'm sure it's amazing what you uncover once you really start getting into this. It is. Just, I have to be – I look for a particular type of story. These are not history books. So if ever someone buys a book looking for the story of one of their favorite athletes, even some of the biggest stars not, might not necessarily be in the book. And instead, it might have stories about athletes that you really never heard of because they weren't big stars. But it has to be stories that I can tie into Scripture. In other words, the stories in the book are not random. They are picked to serve a particular purpose, to make a particular point. And, you know, some of the stories you just find, everybody knows, I think, particularly Alabama fans, 
to this day, they probably say the 79 Sugar Bowl is the greatest Alabama game in history. Many people still do. If you remember it, I do. I'm certainly old enough to remember it, unfortunately. I was already <laughs> way grown. That was the game Alabama and Penn State were ranked number one and number two. Uh, and Penn State had first and goal. Late in the game, Alabama fumbled, and Penn State moved to a first and goal at the line at the nine. And then on after, on their third down play, they wound up just inches short of the goal line. And so, what's interesting about this story is that they were the players were unpiling, and uh, Penn State had a quarterback named Chuck Fusina, uh, who, whom you might have heard of, and he was. Uh, Standing there watching, you know, the refs put the ball down. And Alabama's tackle, a guy named Marty Lyons, who was quite a good ball player, was standing there next to him. They were just both standing there looking at the ball, looking how far it was from the goal line. And Fusina looked over at, at, uh, at Marty, the Alabama player, and he says, what do you think? Well, Lyons thought a minute, and then he said, you better throw the ball. <laughs> And um, they went back to their huddles, and Penn State didn't take his advice. They ran the ball, and Alabama held them and won the national championship 14-7. to seven. How about that? I always that? thought it was kind of interesting that there they were standing there talking about what play they ought to run. They sh- Penn State should have listened to Marty Lyons, I guess. I'll tell you what, that, that is very interesting. We're, uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back with more with Ed McMinn. You're live with Mark Dykeson in the game, High School Sports Magazine on News Talk 105.9 WVGA. You're live with Mark Dykeson in the game, High School Sports Magazine on News Talk 105.9 WVGA. And Jeff and I are visiting with Ed McMahon today, who's written several books, and uh, they all have the same title, Daily Devotions for Diehard Fans, just, just different schools. And before we get back to some stories and discussion, uh, Ed, first, can you tell the people listening if they would like to to get one of these books, how they'd go about doing that? Well, they're they're available in Valdosta at a couple of sites, Mockingbird and the Potter's House. and But they're also available online. Our website is www.diehardfans.com with a hyphen. And we right now we've arranged for a coupon on the website so that you will type in, in the game, all one word, then you can get a, a discount on the book price. Well, great. And and what what is the, the regular price, the normal price? Um, we sell them at fourteen ninety five, and uh, it, there is a volume discount. Uh, and of course, what the various bookstores and Christian bookstores that sell them, we recommend the price, but they, it's usually fourteen ninety five. Right now, also we want to point out too, and and while in the South we love our football, and probably the majority, like of this Georgia book, is football. There are some other sports included. I try to make it uh, all the sports. If you're going to write a Georgia sports book, you got to have gymnastics in there, uh, and so there are several gymnastics stories. The Tennessee book has certainly got women's basketball and Pat Summit. Even the Gator book, which was, you know, hard for me to write, but the Gator book has. Uh, You've got the national championships in basketball. They have to be in there. Sure. And I just finished writing. It's not published yet. It'll be out. It'll be a while. The University of North Carolina book, which is predominantly basketball, because their basketball program has been much more successful yeah. than their football program. Now, uh, what's a what's a, a favorite story that comes to mind that's not football? Um, I one of them involved a the Alabama basketball team. You don't think much of Alabama, but that's what I say. I look for stories that have a certain uh, a twist to them. They were – Alabama play, went over and played Mississippi State right after World War II. And the Mississippi State, as a lot of facilities were at that time, Georgia's gym was so bad that they actually had basketball games rained out. But the <laughs> Mississippi State had – Old Quonset huts. That's what they used for their gymnasium left over from World War II. And Alabama went over there and played them in the late 40s, and the place was really so primitive that there wasn't any place for the Alabama coach to meet with his players at halftime. So uh, he took them outside. And uh, they were outside in the dark, but he was going to, you know, they were all going to meet. But unfortunately, one of the things that they didn't know, his name was Jim Homer. 
And one of the things that Jim Homer and the players weren't aware of is that there was an open, open sewage line out there. And three of his starters promptly walked out the back door, walked out the door there into the dark and fell into an open sewer. <laughs> so head first, completely down under, all the way under, uniform and all, shoes, socks, everything. And so uh, Homer, you know, they tried to towel off and, that Homer said, well, you just got to play, boys. And they got him back inside the Quonset hut where it was much hotter. And they were smelling so bad. He just decided they couldn't even be around him. So he sent his players. There was a shower in the gym. So the players all went into the shower. But they showered with their shorts and their shoes and their socks and everything on and had to go out and play the last half, basically soaking wet, squishy. And uh, they played well enough, though, that Alabama did win the game. But I think that's probably – I've, I've enjoyed that story. I thought it was a pretty funny story and a, a reflection of how different times were a couple of generations ago. Now, with each book, you have 10 different books, and there, it's not just like the Georgia book and the Florida book is the same thing over and over again. No. Now, each book is, is separate. How long does it take you on the average to, to write? How long did it take you to write the Georgia book, for instance? Well, I have to find the stories one at a time. There's just no easy way you know, to do it. But I can usually... I can write a book in a couple of months, including the editing, get it done from, from scratch. The The format is the same. You're right. Each book is different. I, I get fi- get quite a few questions. People ask us, well, are the Auburn book and the Georgia book the same? Well, that's a good way to get tarred and feathered, just stick a bulldog story in the middle of an Auburn book. No, they are not the same. They're all they're all different. They're all, the Auburn book, as, as Mark mentioned, is, is nothing but Auburn stories. So I just – it takes me a couple of months. Now, do the schools get involved in any bit? Do they know you're doing it? No, do you ask them they're or? not involved. This is strictly a private uh, – it's actually a ministry disguised as a business. Um, that's one of the – you know, we looked into it when Simon & Schuster, as we said, published the first two. And then we decided – we learned enough from working with them that we decided we could do this. Um, but the – Books are different. You know, if you we don't we don't use any of the logos on purpose, uh, so that we you know we have control over the content of the book and not the university. Short of the book being red for Georgia and orange for Auburn, that's that's about the only tie-in I saw in it. That's it. It's just the colors and of course the name of the school and that's all. Yeah. Well, you know, very interesting stories. Now, do you ever do speaking engagements? I do. Uh, I've done a few. I liked last Sunday. I went up to a church in Macon, and they held a basically it was a cool idea. I wish I'd thought of it when I was a pastor. They had a tailgate party before their evening service, and their the the folks, uh, their members of the congregation, all brought their their bulldog tents and their tech tents. And they're, you know, they're, uh, they're gator tents. And uh, they brought their grills and they all cooked outdoors and they wore all the bulldog gear or their uh, Auburn gear. And they, they had a tailgate party before the evening service. And then when they went in to worship, I, was, I delivered the sermon. I was a preacher, I, I was the guest preacher. And what I do do is pretty much what I have here. I use this to tell some stories and then tie those stories into aspects of our faith. Well, if, if you could, right quick, give us a story and then, and then briefly tie it into Scripture so, so the listeners know exactly you know, what, what, what the book is. All right, one of the – let's use the most famous play in Georgia football history. And uh, I was there. I was old, I'm old enough. I was there. I saw it. I saw it. And that's the famous flea flicker play. And you remember that one? Nah, that's before your time. That's before my time, but before your time. But but right. I did I did read right. read the story. Guy, gen, guys who are my age or a little younger will remember that story. It was the 1965 season opener against Alabama. This was the Alabama team of Joe Namath. They were ranked number one in the nation. It was Vince Dooley's second year uh, in Athens, and uh, Georgia took actually took an early lead, ten to nothing. And that, and but Alabama rallied and took a seventeen to ten lead, uh, going late in the game. You know there were only a couple of minutes, about two minutes left to play. It looked like Georgia, you know, had played way over their heads, uh, but uh, was was had gotten beat. Played Alabama pretty close, and Alabama did go on to win the national championship that year. But uh, 
with Georgia, Georgia was sitting at their own 27 with about two minutes left to play. So what they needed then, of course, was what was called, what Vince Dooley called a desperation play. And they had one ready. Dooley called it the flea flicker. Now, what the play, well, we'll, I'll tell you, when they, when he called it, the quarterback was a guy named Kirby Moore. And when the Georgia player brought the play in, he looked over at that player and said, come on now, Coach Dooley didn't call that play. Tell me the real play. We need a real play here. And the guy said, yeah, you know, he had to convince the quarterback that was the play they were going to run. And he said, yeah, that's the play. And so Kirby Moore looked around a minute, and he got called the huddle in, and he said, guys, you remember that play we ran in practice that never worked? That's what we're going to do. And the truth was that it never, when they practiced it, it had never worked. Um, the fullback was a guy uh, named Bob Taylor. And he said he, could, he thought Kirby Moore was joking because he said it was like something from a playground. And what it was, it's a simple play. Now you've seen it several times, I guess, since then, where the quarterback hit a receiver and the receiver lateraled back to a trailing, trailing back. I mean, it was a simple play, right. but this is 1965 trick plays. This was before Bobby Bowden's yeah, time. This was two yards in the cloud of yeah, dust. Yeah, I mean, you know, Georgia didn't throw – only threw a few passes every game. And so they call that play. And the thing was that Moore – the end's name was Pat Hodson. Moore hit Hodson with a strike. And Hodson lateral back to Bob Taylor, and he went 73 yards for a touchdown. And, of course, Alabama – you can ask any Alabama fan. They brought it up last Sunday, didn't we? We brought this up at the church, mentioned this play, and the Alabama fan immediately said his knee was on the ground. They still remember <laughs> – they still believe Pat Hodson's knee was on the ground when he caught the ball. Well, then Georgia went for the two-point conversion and won the ball game, beat number one ranked Alabama 18-17. to 17. But the point we were trying to that – was, that's the play in this devotional. It's about trick plays. And the point I make is that in our life, there are a lot of people all around us who, have, who are trying to pull some trick plays over on us. We've all gotten emails telling us to send money somewhere to get rich. Uh, we have people knocking on our front door. They'll, they'll pave our driveway for a ridiculous price. We've all seen these ads on TV that tell us we can lose weight without having to diet or, or exercise. So the point is that we have to look through things. We think things through and look them over before we decide. And the same thing is true with our spiritual matters too because there is a lot, there is a lot of false religions uh, and bogus Christian denominations around. And so the key to deciding whether this is really something or is a trick is what this group does with Jesus Christ. If they don't treat Jesus as the Son of God, the ruler of the universe, and the only way to salvation, then they're bogus. It's trick play. And so the good news is that Jesus sounds too good to be true. Jesus sounds like a trick play. But there's no catch. It's the real thing. Yeah, we all have a hard time understanding that because in, in this life, it's always strings attached, isn't there? There are. But with Jesus, there it's not a yeah. trick play. Like yeah. It's no flea flicker. Well, that's great. I tell you, it seems like this book really would appeal to all ages. Well, uh, what's been interesting that I really didn't realize is that how many uh, youth pastors, for instance, have been buying them the books uh, in making uh, group purchases to give to their kids, particularly their boys. They worked real well with teenage boys who, I guess, you know, I would think you'd have a difficult time getting to read the Bible. But this seems to work real well. It, it kind of hooks them. And like I said, you're reading about the Bulldogs or South Carolina, the Gamecocks, or even the Gators, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up. And that, so they have done real well. They're doing real well. Youth, a lot of youth pastors have used them. How about in schools? Are you, uh, do you have them in any schools or no. do you have any coaches? Or? Um, well, yes, we do. Some coaches have – we've used them with some coaches, particularly, you know, Christian coaches who want to give their boys something to read and also that will help guide them a little bit. So, yes, we have we have had some coaches use them. Well, I tell you, it, it's certainly a very interesting book. We're going to take a short break right now, and we'll be back with more with Ed. You're live with Mark Dykes and In the Game High School Sports Magazine on News Talk 105.9 WVGA. 
You're live with Mark Dykes and In the Game, High School Sports Magazine on News Talk 105.9 WVGA. And we were just going to the break, and uh, Ed's wife, Slynn, was uh, chatting with us and wanted to make sure that we let everybody know that this book is just not for guys. And so we've got her to join us here and, and, and tell us from a, from a woman's standpoint of view about the book. Well, I've always been a sports fan. I'm especially baseball sports fan. I was a scorekeeper here at, for VSU for a few years under Coach Thomas. And so I'm a big fan of sports as well. And when Ed started writing them, of course, I was involved with the ministry as a supportive in a supportive role. But then when Simon & Schuster published the first two and we realized that God was leading us in our lives in this direction to take over, we actually established a publishing company, which I own, and we started publishing them themselves. And then I became directly involved, and it required me being um, every day in with the sports and the mm-hmm. book and the reading. So I did a lot of editing of the books. And as I began to read them, I realized that my passions in sports were as strong as Ed's or any other man's. And I think sometimes as women, we kind of downplay our role in sports or what but we are huge supporters from the mom that does goes to all the soccer games to i mean the wife that sits in the room and watches tv ed and i can't sit in the same room and watch georgia anymore but we no. uh we each have our own <laughs> tv well, personal affair <laughs> well i can you know i'm sure that uh and you're right you know we in dealing with all the young athletes that that we run across it's certainly the moms who are responsible for getting those uh, sports career started early and i can also see uh you know this book would make a great birthday gift or christmas gift well, like it does. See, you know the woman's doing most of the shopping this would be a wonderful gift for anyone out there listening that wants to get someone there are uh, a lot of women's sports in the books as well as men's sports so there's a lot of um there's a lot of draw for women to read the book as well as men both are men's sports and women's sports in addition there's a lot of gift opportunities for this and we do tend to buy more than men buy so we when we find something that's both interesting and fascinating with sports but also ties into christ and what he's done for us and we feel like we can put that in the hands of somebody we know and love and maybe bring their faith walk closer we certainly go look for products like that and this product actually meets that on but on all levels yeah i mean a great 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 gift now now ed i know uh You've got a story you want to get in here. Well, one I thought we favorite close. one. I'll, yeah, let's. I'll let's. tell it very quickly. Uh, it's probably I've written over a thousand devotions now, and this remains my favorite. It's for the uh, Auburn fans out there, and this one is a little different from some of the others. I, I always I try to pick stories that are funny, humorous, unexpected, but also stories that touch us, that touch our hearts. This one always touches me, and the scripture that I use is from Matthew, where the women are standing there watching Jesus hanging on the cross. It's the worst day in the history of the world. And uh, the sports part of it ties in with the, goes back to the 1998 Auburn season, which Auburn fans will certainly remember. It was the year that that, uh, Coach Bowden, Terry Bowden, resigned in the middle of the season. They didn't even have a coach. They had an interim head coach. It was supposed to be a good season. They were two and five when Arkansas came to Auburn to play. Arkansas was seven and oh, ranked in the top ten. And Auburn's quarterback, you might remember him as a guy named Gabe Gross, who actually went on to play Major League Baseball. He debuted with the Yankees in 2004. But he was the quarterback. And this is – we talk about loss and losing, tying in with the Jesus crucifixion. And Gabe Gross's last pass went incomplete. He came over to the sidelines. You know, he'd given all that he had, and Arkansas was going to win 24-21. to 21. There was nothing they could do about it. So he was on the sidelines, of course. He dropped, took his helmet off, dropped down to one knee, hung his head. And as he was there feeling pretty miserable and awful, he heard something, and at first he couldn't figure out what it was. Now, I don't know if you've never been to Jordan-Hare Stadium. It's a lot like Sanford Stadium in Athens. It's almost the same size. It's, it's big. It's huge. And as Gabe Gross was on the sidelines, um, he couldn't make out what he was, but he noticed that it, was, it started moving around the stadium. And before long, the whole stadium, 90-something thousand, almost 90,000 people, were all chanting something together. And when Gabe Gross realized what they were saying, he got up off of his knee, stood up, and started chanting with them. 
because what they were chanting on this awful day, their whole football program was in shambles. They had won only two games all season. They didn't even have a coach. They'd gotten beat again. And what they were all chanting was, it's great to be an Auburn Tiger. And the reason, and it still touches me every time I tell this story, the reason this is my favorite devotion is that I believe that this story is a perfect metaphor for the life of faith, that no matter how bad things are through our Savior Christ, we have the power to make it a great day. And every day becomes a day of victory and joy. Yeah, amen. Yeah, wonderful story. Now, before we have to go, if you could remind everyone of your website. Uh, it's www.diehardfans.com, diehard with a hyphen. And the books are also available at Mockingbird and Potter's House here in Valdosta. And again, let me remind you, we put in a special coupon for the show that when you go to the page and that you can type in at the appropriate place. In the game, one word, then you can get a discount on your book orders. Well, I tell you what, if you're, you know, certainly if you're looking for a, uh, you know, uh, even some early Christmas gifts, uh, this this is just a wonderful, great stocking stuffer here. Uh, encourage everyone to visit the website, and certainly if you're a Georgia fan, look at the Georgia book. I mean, Alabama, Auburn, and got more schools coming. It's just uh, something we highly recommend. Uh, getting and, and, and reading. it's gr- Once you pick it up, I don't think you can put it down. I hadn't been able to. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for listening. We look forward to next week and football will be in full swing, so we'll have a lot to talk about. You're live with Mark Dykes and In the Game, High School Sports on News Talk 105.9 WVGA.